London was the county seat for um, Bedford County. Bedford had been broken off from Lunenburg County in 1754. Uh, they located the town here at a crossroads for migration. And at that point uh, in the late 18th century, you had a lot of people passing through here and it was kind of the last stop for gas before you went off west to Kentucky and Tennessee. And so New London is a good example of a place that becomes a place of, of movement after the French and Indian War. Uh, here's this tavern, it's at the, at the crossroads of, of roads that lead to the Great Wagon Road or the road that goes on down through the Cumberland Gap. So New London was a place where they manufactured gunpowder, they repaired the rifles, uh, they you know, collected saddles, made saddles, blacksmiths were there. Uh, there was quite a little industry. Meats Tavern is a very interesting structure. Um, first of all, it's perhaps the oldest structure standing in the Central Virginia area. Initially, it was a tavern that was across the street from the courthouse. Um, you can just picture, you can imagine, you know, court is adjourned or there is a recess and uh, the men from the courthouse come in to, uh, you know, to discuss the case or to talk about something else. You can imagine travelers heading, uh, heading west. This is their last stop. They stop to pick up their, their supplies and their last minute things that they need before they head out to the frontier at the local merchants and they might stop in to Mead's Tavern or some other tavern and, you know, for a bit of refreshment to just kind of regroup and, and be ready for the rest of their journey. There's um, a natural spring, uh, an alum and iron spring at the base of the hill to the, just to the west of town. And by the 1840s, I believe, one of the uh, tavern owners over here named um, Peregrine Eccles had started to take advantage of that. And it was at a time when people were traveling to all these springs around Virginia and West Virginia for their health. Uh, and so he erected some log cabins out uh, near what's today Route 460, and he started having guests at the, the, uh, at the cabins. And then what happened, it became so popular that by the early 1870s, a consortium of wealthy people came in uh, and threw in with him and purchased all that land, including the springs. There was a great deal of activity there. It was sort of a center of commerce. And it became a focus during the Revolutionary War as well because there was an arsenal there. Yeah, the arsenal, I would say, is the, the primary part of its uh, colonial significance because there were only, I believe, five continental uh, army arsenals in the colonies uh, at the time of the, the Revolution. And this was the southernmost of the arsenals. So it was very significant. Um, it, it, in fact, it supplied all the munitions and arms for General Greene on his southern campaign during the Revolution. So when Bedford County was reconfigured, the present town of Bedford, or Liberty, became the new county seat. In Campbell County, Rustburg became the new county seat. So that New London, which was on the very edge of the new Campbell County, sort of lost its reason for being. It was no longer a civic center. Lynchburg at the same time was starting to grow. It was at a ferry crossing on the James River. And then as canal trade grew and then as eventually railroads came in, uh, New London sort of uh, was eclipsed by new communities. It was a bustling colonial outpost, um, you know, on the front, close to the frontier, um, and really a place of great prosperity. And that's why there were these great predictions that New London would become a you know, tremendous American city. And then sometime after that, um, I believe it was in the early 20th century that the post office was, was closed and there's no longer a New London on the map. It doesn't exist anymore. And so, for example, if you wanted to GPS or Google New London, you wouldn't find anything because there is no town there. It represents uh, the colonial period that has gone past, which, though it's forgotten now, was a vital crossroads in the back country of Virginia. We think of the back country now as a frontier, you know, a place where you're heading the way and you're moving forward. They didn't think of it that way. They thought of it as 
the back part, right? They're in the border and their backs are up against the wall, literally with the Appalachian Mountains, right? Also with Indian tribes on the other side of the mountains. Also before the French and Indian War with the French on the other side of the mountains. So really these backcountry people are caught with one empire or two on one side of the mountains, another sort of empire to them, the Tidewater region on the other, and so they sort of see themselves in between. Yeah, in the American Revolution, there were divisions between those who supported the Crown, those who supported George Washington and the American Revolution. And those divisions were particularly pronounced in the South. And so much of the South saw a little civil war during the American Revolution. And Virginia was torn apart as well. And so in 1780 and 1781, there were a lot of tensions between those who supported and opposed the American Revolution. And that became even stronger as uh, British troops moved into Virginia towards the culmination of the war leading up to the uh, surrender at Yorktown. A lot of the leaders that come into the backcountry actually come from the Tidewater. There are elites that come in and try to gain control. They eventually become more of the patriot leaders in the backcountry, whereas a lot of the common folks are actually Tories. They remember the French Empire on the other side of the mountains. A patriot victory might mean they think the reestablishment of the French Empire on the other side of the mountain. And so that's not what they want. And so this creates a tremendous tension. When you get to the American Revolution, uh, there are examples of leaders who you know, set up trials and try loyalist sympathizers. The Lynch family was really significant in Central Virginia and the Lynchburg area. And so one brother established a ferry that led to the city of Lynchburg at the ferry crossing. But the other brother that's less known is Charles Lynch, and he lives south of town in what's now Alta Vista. Uh, Charles Lynch was um, a military leader. He was an entrepreneurial leader. He was a justice of the peace or a magistrate, but he sometimes was held responsible for bringing vigilante justice on the frontier. And it's probably not fair to call it vigilante justice because he was a magistrate trying to enforce the law where he was, but in the absence of courts and settled government, sometimes he had to be creative. Now, the term lynch had nothing to do with racial tensions. He was going after Tories to try to bring Tories to uh, a respectable pattern of life, and it had nothing to do with actual hangings or killings, but his process was to, to whip people until they would submit. But, but what's interesting is that there's probably a majority of loyalist sympathizers among commoners. And according to the stories, all you had to do was to say liberty or liberty forever, and then you'd be released, because in saying liberty it would show your sympathies to the patriot cause rather than the Tory cause. So lynchings aren't associated with Lynchburg, but with the brother of the man for whom Lynchburg is named, Charles Lynch, and the patriot justice exacted from uh, the Tories on the frontier. In the Hook case, uh, Hook was trying to collect money for a couple of steers that had been stolen towards the tail end of the American Revolution by someone representing the American Army. It's a famous case involving a wealthy, famous, although not very well-liked, merchant in New London. Uh, but what's especially famous about it is that Patrick Henry uh, came to uh, defend the defendant. And Patrick Henry was uh, a jurist or an attorney par excellence. Few people had the rhetorical power of Patrick Henry and the ability to engage his jury. And so in the Hook case, Patrick Henry uh, was at his very best. He was a powerful rhetorical speaker, and he won over the audience. Uh, I was reading one account where someone went to hear Patrick Henry argue. And this young man said he went there knowing that Henry was on the wrong side of the case, and he left there knowing that Henry was on the wrong side of the case. But when Henry spoke, he was so persuasive that Henry just won him over. 
Now, much of it had to do with political issues. And so John Hook was a Tory. He was sympathetic to the crown. He was a loyalist. And uh, many of the folks in New London were patriots. They were sympathetic to the American cause. But there was more to it than that. Uh, Hook was a merchant who sometimes aggressively went after debtors. And so there was a lot of folks that didn't like Hook because of commercial reasons as well as political reasons. And Patrick Henry painted this tremendous contrast between patriots who had endorsed the war, suffered for the war, soldiers who were starving in the cause of the war, and this greedy, wealthy Tory sympathizer. The only thing he was able to say is beef, beef, beef. He wanted his money for his cows. And um, Henry, in many ways, replicates the popular appeal and rhetorical power of the Parsons cause, a case that made him really famous in 1763. So he wins the, the jury over. And things got so bad that Hook not only lost the case, but he feared he was in danger of being tarred and feathered, and he scooted out of town. But Henry was so powerful in giving this speech that the audience is cracking up with laughter. It was fun, it was entertaining, but it was also a, a powerful division between these two communities in backcountry Virginia, loyalist and patriot. And sometimes that's horrifying to people, but when you think that um, Benedict Arnold, the traitor, is bringing a British army into Virginia at that time, when Bannister Tarleton, the hated Tory butcher, is bringing troops into Virginia. These were really tough times. And so traitors like John Hook or others were seen with tremendous suspicion because patriots were literally fighting for their lives on the frontier. Remembering a place like New London, and more specifically Mead's Tavern, is really an essential part of preserving our past. There's a lot that's happening. So to my mind, New London represents this microcosm of the Virginia back country. But then it fades away. And so in some ways, unlike other communities which grew and then were transformed over time, uh, New London was preserved uh, just because uh, time sort of passed it by. Researching and uncovering these kinds of histories is, is rewarding and challenging at the same time. Um, it's Sometimes you learn as much as you can learn from a book or a document from people in the community who've been passing stories down uh, for generations. And they feel a part of this, this structure, this site, this location, and they have something to tell. The caution with that is, you know, how do we tell how much of that story is, is tradition and how much of it can be historically documented? You know, I'm not sure what will happen with Mead's Tavern and New London, but there are tremendous possibilities. At one time, New London was looked at as a way to recreate uh, a small segment of American history in the same way that Williamsburg was captured in time, although on a smaller scale. And there are still structures at New London that are very old, Mead's Tavern being the best example, uh, but others as well, o old church buildings, uh, old stores, uh, New London Academy, the oldest building from the New London Academy dates back to the 18th century as well. Um, this could be a, a real unique place in terms of historical preservation and then local interest in the past. People talk about, you know, what level of significance does a, a building or a site have? And, you know, there's regional and state and national. Right now, Meats Tavern looks like an ugly old house covered with white vinyl siding. Um, and, but when you begin to become acquainted with it, it becomes more and more um, attractive, I guess, so to speak, if you know a little bit of the story behind it. I think Mead's Tavern is a really important place to study. It's the oldest structure in the Lynchburg area, and it represents uh, the colonial period that has gone past. The structure itself um, vaguely resembles what it may have been like in around the year 1800. There's an addition on the right side that was added much, much later um, that is clearly separate. And then there are several additions in the back. One is a modern kitchen and bathroom that have been added. Um, it looks as if perhaps the final or one of the later additions actually incorporated an existing 
building that was the kitchen. I think the most viable possibility that they've come up with has been to restore the structure to uh, its earliest stage. And we don't know exactly what year that would be, but sometime around the end of the 18th century. And um, for the exterior, uh, to, to remove most of the additions, there seems to be some agreement about keeping at least part of the, the side addition to use as something like a gift shop or you know an office area or a museum or something like that and then to interpret a couple of rooms on the first floor as the tavern uh, and to try to communicate through that the interaction that would take place between social classes, um, among different uh, people from different communities, the travelers that would come through, people from the courthouse, local dignitaries, this kind of thing. And then also uh, to, to uh, incorporate into that tavern um, other segments of society that we might not immediately think about when we think about colonial history. We always think about, you know, people like Patrick Henry, who has a connection to New London, and maybe Thomas Jefferson, but what about some of the women in the community that were less known, that we don't, you know, we don't know that much about, or, or the men who were, uh, you know, just ordinary workers on, uh, you know, in, in the fields or uh, in the stores, the merchants and so forth. And then you have the African American community, but they have a, a presence in New London, that and that story needs to be told as well. And we also know that there was interaction with the Native American community there. Uh, and we don't know how much of that we can tell from Mead's Tavern, but I think it's certainly something we should consider. So that would all take place uh, on the first floor and then as perhaps a later stage uh, to go upstairs and uh, take a couple of rooms up there and use them in a way that would interpret the girls' school to tell a little bit of the story of you know what the life was like for young girls at the time, what, some things, say some things about education and how that's evolved. As an historian, I love the past, and I love it when people cherish the past. And New London might be a vehicle to introduce people to the past, remind people of the past, think about their heritage, and then think about what it means to be an American, to be a Virginian, and to think about the uh, tremendous opportunities and privileges that we have uh, in this country. I could only hope that it might be used in that fashion. And you can give all the reasons why it's important to preserve the past, but why should we do it in the form of a historic structure or a historic village? Um, I think the reason goes to the ways in which people perceive their past. We can tell stories, and that's wonderful. We can write stories. We can even make films. But when you restore a historic site, you can walk into history, and you can experience, experience it in a sort of three-dimensional fashion that you can't do otherwise. Now we kind of think of history as all about change, right? Change from it. And it's there, no doubt about it. But there's also a, a very interesting continuity. So when you drive by now, you really don't see anything. Um, it's not impressive, uh, it's not exciting, unless you know a little bit about the story. And this is a rich people, a rich people of diversity a certain individualism uh, that, that a lot of people, I think, don't necessarily understand. Now the fact that this is a sort of a forgotten history or a lost history uh, is even more important because if we are not making an effort to preserve those things, to bring them back to life, so to speak, then we end up losing part of our heritage. There are stories that New London has to tell that no other place can tell.